The Detroit Regional Chamber's MPC 20 Conversations Respond and Rebuild Digital Series is provided in partnership with Detroit Public Television and presented by Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan with additional support from Accenture, Bank of America, Barton Mallow, Comerica Bank, Consumers Energy, Delta Dental, Dow, DTE Energy, Enbridge Energy, Ford Motor Company, Huntington Bank, ITC, KPMG, the Kresge Foundation, Kroger, Michigan Economic Development Corporation, PNC Bank, Ralph C. Wilson Jr. Foundation, Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans, the Skillman Foundation, and TCF Bank. And by these supporters. Support for Detroit Public TV's coverage is provided by DTE Energy Foundation and MASCO. We're for people, the pioneers, the underdogs, the players, and the slow and steadies. We're for people, for who they are and who they could become. Yes, we're a bank. And some say our business is all about money, but that's an old idea. Because look past the money and you'll see real human lives. We see it because we're for people. Huntington, welcome. We're here for it all. Day one to year 100. The times you remember and things you'd rather leave behind. Standing by for the late nights, the midday surprises, and everything in between. We're here for it all, and always will be. Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan. Confidence comes with every card. Greetings and welcome to MPC 20 Conversations, Respond and Rebuild. This is a 13-week digital series that will bring smart dialogue focused on our unprecedented challenges to Michiganders across the state. Thank you to the Detroit Regional Chamber, Detroit Public Television, and the many corporate and philanthropic partners for bringing the spirit of the annual Mackinac Policy Conference to us virtually during this critical time when an in-person event focused on moving Michigan forward was just not possible. Today's discussion will address the importance of corporate social responsibility in the business community's role and duty to support such causes. Wood TV 8's Rick Alvin will lead today's conversation. Thank you for tuning in and enjoy. Well, welcome to a timely and perhaps timeless conversation that we're about to have with three leading business leaders around the state of Michigan. This is something that has been in the news a lot lately and I think is something that all three are prepared to discuss and it's corporate social responsibility, business roles <clears throat> and action. So what we want to do is have a very free-flowing conversation with our three panelists. Andy Owen is president and CEO of Herman Miller, Ray Talang, U.S. automotive leader and marketing uh, man market managing partner for Greater Michigan PwC, and Carla Walker Miller, founder and CEO of Walker Miller Energy okay. Services. Welcome to you all. I want to start with you, if I might, Andy, because Herman Miller has a track record for equity and inclusion. There has been um, there has been a focus in these past few months um, about how that can be implemented. Talk to me a little bit about just generically, I'm going to ask each one of you this, about how your companies uh, approach corporate re responsibility. I know we discussed earlier uh, that there are really two tracks, both the internal track, how we deal with people inside the corporate structure, and the external track. Um, how your outward projection is. Andy, could you talk a little about that? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, we have really, Rick, been on a journey of discovery over the past several months, as I think many people have. You know, we have always been a company that's considered ourselves very, very committed to social responsibility, to equity and inclusion, to conscious capitalism, whatever you might call it, for, you know, most of our 116 years. But we've come to recognize over the last I don't know, six or seven months that while we've done some things really, really well, 
there are some areas that we really haven't done as well as we would like. And I think representation and diversity within our internal kind of four walls is one of those things. And we know we need to increase and diversify our population. And we've been working on it for years, uh, but we really haven't moved the needle in a meaningful way. So I think one of the things if I look at our journey that's been really important is that we've really sort of had to admit that the problem was much bigger than we first thought and really acknowledge that we have a lot of work to do. And probably understanding that we couldn't continue to try to solve the problem uh, using the same approaches that we've been using for the last several decades. Uh, so we've really tried to set and apply some things we do really well, which is design thinking. We're a design company. Apply those same principles of design thinking to solving the problems that really are facing us so concretely today in the area of equity and inclusion. And design thinking, just to be super simple, has about five steps. Empathy, defining the problem, ideating, prototyping, and then testing. And as we looked at our approach to diversity, uh, we realized that we had probably skipped to trying to solve the problem before we spent enough time in empathy and really properly defining it. And, and if you kind of take a step back and you say, how do we truly empathize with others? Let's, let's take our black colleagues, for example. We really have to adopt the mindset of a beginner. And what that means as a design thinker is we have to do our best to leave our own assumptions and experiences behind us when we're trying to understand other people's perspectives. And our life experiences, as we all know, create assumptions within us and biases that really we use those things to navigate the world. And so we've really been on a journey of practicing empathy and asking questions about the experiences of our colleagues, our colleagues of color. And it's um it's one of those things that I think people are afraid of. It's uncomfortable. Uh, you don't want to upset someone. You don't want to offend someone. The list goes on. But as we've started to ask different questions and try to mitigate some of our biases and really lean into the uncomfortableness of empathy, uh, we've found different problems that we need to solve. So I would say that's been our kind of our biggest journey and one of the things that I think um, has always been in our DNA that we're really leaning into practice now. Thank you, Andy. Ray, uh, can you talk a little bit, if you would, please, uh, about your approach from your standpoint? Well, I think we have a similar um, you know, story that, that Andy outlined in that uh, it is a journey, and we use that word a lot, that um, and in each one of us within each one of our organizations is at a different point in time along that continuum of, of this journey. Um, from our perspective, um, you know, we've always you know, 80% of our people are below the age of 30. Um, and so we've got a very um, active and, you know, frankly, demanding um, organization when it comes to, to racial equity. And we, we like to think that we've been on the front end of, of this conversation for a long time. But the more we get into it, the more we realize that we've got a lot to learn along the way. And so some of the things that we have focused on um, you know, frankly, it all starts with culture and creating an environment of belonging so that when people wake up in the morning and they put their, their coat on and, and head to work, uh, that they can bring their, their full self to the four walls of, of PWC and feel comfortable doing that. Um, you know, then that, that bridges it to, you know, the types of people that we recruit, the types of, and how we, once they're here, how we develop them, retain them, and intervene, um, you know, when, when we see that uh, perhaps the organization isn't taking a, a, the right path with uh, certain folks that may need a lift, if you will, and may need more support and or uh, may need that advocate. Um, at the right time in their career to get them over over the hurdle. Um, and then it's just being honest with where you are on the journey, um, looking at data. Uh, we're, as you would imagine, for a consulting and accounting firm, uh, we're very data driven. Um, and so, um, you know, the data is one part of the story that we always look to to make sure that um, it's some of the things that we're doing are actually taking hold. Um, and allows us to measure progress over over a period of time. Carla, when you and I spoke recently, both uh, of our leaders here are talking about the journey and thinking that you had made progress, but on further examination, realized there was much more to do. Tell me about your experience, because one of the things you told me that in many ways, you approach this process and you do it without thinking by 
treating people the way you think that they ought to be treated, which was something that intrigued me when we talked yesterday. Uh, thank you. Yeah, it's uh, really interesting because I've had the particular blessing of being able to create a, a company uh, based uh, that's totally informed by my the trauma I experienced in corporate America, being on the other side of the journeys uh, that Ray and Andy are talking about. I uh, spent an inordinate amount of my time trying to position myself to be seen as capable and competent and as a leader. And it was uh, it was draining. And I don't use the word traumatizing lightly. Uh, one of the most interesting things about it is not that I experienced it in a career that started in the 80s, but that Black people and people of color are experiencing that same journey, that same trauma now. So I absolutely applaud all the actions that are being taken right now to number one, recognize that trauma, and number two, to take bold and decisive action to address the trauma that is still occurring every single day. Uh, one of the benefits of being a, a hypersensitive introvert is that when I uh, started my company, I was able to think through how could I have, what kind of company would I have been successful in? And it is a company that has a culture that cares more about the person than the profit. It's a company that has a, a culture that is inclusive, that sees their team members as um, team members. Um, we call our team members team members and one of our core values is stewardship. We don't just pay your check. We allow you to live the way you wanna live and to pay your bills. So uh, a, a company that allows people to hold us to, not just the mantra of our core values, but are we behaving in a way every day that makes you feel valued? Uh, there are, feeling valued is not the typical corporate experience, I think, for most people, and especially for Black people, Black women, uh, particularly. So um, as traumatic as my experience has been, it, it was my journey and it has allowed me to be totally comfortable having conversations that are not only uncomfortable because that is obvious, but some of these conversations are going to be painful by necessity. I have uh, the experience of the racial justice discussions that we're having now have been triggering for a lot of people who have not are not just learning about it, but have lived it and have not, have been muffled. We have not been able to talk about it. So now that we have permission, uh, now that it is part of a, a business conversation, which among the many things we've been told over the decades is that there was no place in business to talk about race and injustice. But now that it is part, then we are being asked to recount our stories and the lessons learned from our stories and to help people who run large majority businesses. And it is really important that our voices are heard there, but that our voices and our thinking and our emotions, they, they really do come at, uh, at a price. Andy, I wanna ask you a question specific <clears throat> to your company, although it could apply to, I think, any company. Change comes from the top. It starts there, but it has to stream all the way through uh, your entire organization, kind of like a supply chain. It has to go all the way through or it doesn't, the impact can't be fully recognized until everybody in the organization is aware and understanding. How, how are you trying to do that with, with your team? You know, I'm really, I'm uh, really moved by, by what our other panelists are saying, but I, I think the conversation and making room for conversations in a corporate environment, I think has been one of the things that has been most impactful for, well, certainly for me personally, um, but I think for everyone in our organization. So um, when the horrible tragedy that happened with George Floyd and, and so many other unfortunate uh, people of color over the centuries, but, but what happened really brought to light the need for all of us to have these conversations. And as Carla said, you know, we weren't having these conversations in the workplace before. So at Herman Miller, we, we started a new program this summer in response to this, and we called it The Lens. And really what it is, is creating space for employee-led dialogue, 
for people to have these courageous conversations because we can't rely on our black and brown colleagues to carry the water for us and tell us about their experiences as so many of them have graciously done. But we also have to take our own experiences and listen and learn. And the open dialogue that we've been having is really uh, raising awareness. And I think more and more, we see our people starting to acknowledge how much we don't know uh, and really actively seeking to understand our impact and the role that we can play in making change. So these conversations are all voluntary. You know, I attend them, you know, my leadership team attends them, uh, but we've had a huge demand across the organization to really lean in. And, you know, we've had 14 sessions so far. We do them every couple of weeks and topics have really ranged from the history of racism, to white privilege, to microaggressions, to self-care uh, in this kind of environment. And what we've heard from our employees is that um, they feel more informed, they feel less afraid to have these conversations in the workplace. They feel more comfortable speaking up when they see an injustice, uh, their teams are more sensitive, uh, and they're reacting differently and behaving differently in different kinds of situations and, and moments when they might have not had the learning they had before. So I think for us as a leader, you know, with change starting at the top, being able to participate and being able to lead from a place of vulnerability. I don't have all the answers. My team doesn't have all the answers, uh, but we are all leaning in to learn. And that's been really critical uh, for us. Uh, you said something there that was impactful for me. You talked about how much we don't know. I mean, it, this really is about learning. Ray, I think you did something recently at PwC. You had your first ever diversity and inclusion transparency report, and I assume at least part of the reason for that was to learn. Well, yes, and and again, it's all part of the journey, um, and, and the report itself uh, <laughs> didn't happen overnight. Um, to, to um, you know, as our CEO says, um, you know, these conversations started five, six years ago when we were moving along our, our journey and realized that you know, part of that was to be transparent with our stakeholders. Um, and as we began to prepare for that, this eventuality, we realized that the data was telling a story that, that caused us to, to really behave differently in a lot of different ways. We thought we were making good progress, but it wasn't showing up in our numbers. Um, and so we needed to pivot further from where we were to ensure that uh, we were doing all the things necessary to really make an impact. And, um, yeah, and so this, this past uh, September, earlier than the September, we issued our first ever um, transparency report where we outlined all, all the various programs and, and frankly where we are in that continuum as, as a way to kind of really reinforce our commitment to this space and lead from the front. Um, you know, we were hoping that, that you know, others, uh, not only as part of CEO action, which I'm sure we'll talk about a little bit, uh, but also as we engage with CEOs like Andy and Carla uh, to talk about what their journey looks like, um, you know, hopefully they'll join us along the way um, um, to, to provide that level of transparency uh, to their to, to their employees and other stakeholders, including customers and and suppliers. Carla, talk a little bit, if you would, about what what you're hearing, uh, because obviously we we have leaders that are making uh, legitimate, honest attempts uh, to try to be more inclusive, and both have said that they continue to do that, even though they realize there's much they do not know. Uh, what, from your standpoint, inside your company, have you found that that helps uh, to to get people to just simply understand each other? One of the most important things for us is that we've always been open about the racial issues. When when most people go their entire lives without working for a black company, that's just factual. So when people come into my company, they already have to be open to work for a black CEO in a black city. Um, and they're, they do have a different experience because uh, you would think that because we are black, we have the whole diversity, equity and inclusion thing uh, uh, down pat. And we don't. We recruit a multicultural team that uh, reflects the diversity of this country. So we have to be sensitive. The fact that we are very intentional about our vocabularies, the fact that we are learning, we are on a learning journey 
every single time. The fact that we want a MAGA hat wearing Trump supporter to be as comfortable in our company as long as they are good people of goodwill trying to do the right thing means that we have the responsibility to be the company that, again, people of goodwill can be successful in. So uh, the journey, the learning journey is not is not one sided at all. The uh, the place of pain, the making space for allowing, I have to be informed about people's uh, journeys and their lived experiences. Uh, I am so clear on the value of diversity, but no one has uh, no one has everything figured out on on race on. Uh, gender equality on anything. And as soon as we think we have it figured out, the vocabulary changes, the thinking uh, changes, the conversation changes. So it's uh, it's a learning journey every single day on so many issues. Uh, one of the things I, I share with uh, my white friends who are struggling with the racial conversations is I have a, a nephew who was born a niece and uh, the journey that my niece born had to take a loan because the adults in her family did not understand, period, did not understand who she was, who he was, right? That journey, the fact that AJ, born Aisha, took that journey alone without the adults who adore him, helping him through that journey is shameful. What would really be shameful is if another person born into my family had to take that same journey. If we did not learn from AJ's experience, if we did not become the champions who deliver what the people that we love in our families and the people for whom we are responsible in our companies need. We have to deliver what they need, not what we want to give them, not what we think they need. I want to talk more about what you're all doing within your companies. I want to talk about CEO action. You mentioned that a minute ago, but I just want to take this. And this is, this is just a question I'm thinking of as I'm sitting here. How different is it or how important is it that as community leaders, as business leaders, that you not only do this internally, but Andy, I'll start with you, that your company puts that vision forward outside your four walls. In other words, not just to try to learn, take the journey as you've talked about, but how do you apply that to the broader community of which you are a part? Yeah, I think it's critical. And, and you know, I want to applaud Ray and his company for their transparency report. I think many of us, it, it doesn't happen overnight, but I think getting to the point where you are public with your progress and what you're doing is so important. But as we thought about the impact we want to have as an organization, one of the things that we were faced with, one of the, to Carla's point, one of the data points. So when you look at the design community as a whole, less than 4% of the design community is black. If you look at, you know, how many people of color are there? What's the, what's the percent of our population? There's a big gap between the percent of our population that is black and the percent of designers. And then you look at the percent of students in design school that are black. There's a big gap there too. And we said, if we want to increase our representation, if we want to create a truly, as Carla says, diverse community and culture within our company, we have to impact the pipeline of talent. We have to make design school and design as a career uh, an, an option for elementary school kids and high school kids and people that are entering design school. And then we have to do a better job as an industry of opening our doors. And so we said, hey, what can we as Herman Miller do? You know, we're a pretty big company. Let's lean in there and we can do internships. And, and then we realize for us to truly have an impact, we, we have to band together. So we started the process of creating a design consortium where we hope to attract uh, like-minded companies with the design uh, functions, and there are many of them. There are hundreds of them in the state of Michigan alone, thousands across the United States that employ designers. If we can band together and make a commitment similar to Ray's uh, CEO action commitment to diversifying the design community. Wow, imagine the impact 
hundreds of companies could have by making a commitment to um, talking about design at a much younger age, opening up the design education system and opening up jobs. And, and I think one of the, we're working with uh, four different black designers to help us kind of get this off the ground. And one of them said to me, hey, listen, all we really need to start this is for some of y'all to just open doors, just yeah. open some doors for us. And so we know as Herman Miller, we can probably open smaller doors but as we go out there and try to get commitments from other companies, we think we can open a lot more doors. So we do think it's our responsibility to practice what we preach, but also get out there and bring some other people along with us. Maria, let's talk about CEO action and how you and your company try to go beyond just internally and how you want to try to help affect change. Uh, so CEO action, uh, Rick, for, for those uh, viewers that aren't familiar with it, uh, you know, started about three years ago. Um, and as my CEO tells the story, uh, he took the reins of PwC in July of 2016. And within a week, there were a number of incidences that uh, were racially charged um, and and caused him to take a step back to reevaluate his plan. And, and what galvanized it was a conversation he had with, with one of our staff people as he was leaving the office that said, hey, you know what, Tim, we do a great job of you know, really think, talking about things and, 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 and investing in our people. But what are we doing outside of you know, the four walls of PwC? And it caused Tim to take a step back and think about, you know, what our role is in our communities to, to really make an impact as community leaders, as business leaders. Um, and ultimately, after having a number of conversations with uh, a number of his counterparts at uh, the Fortune 500 and the like, uh, that gave quote unquote birth to what is now called CEO Action, which essentially is a consortium of uh, now a group that consists of people that are companies and organizations that are opting into um, a commitment to you know, make an impact on, on their organizations in a meaningful way. And there's four things that they're simply committing to do. Um, one is to, to talk about the, you know, have those complex conversations, those sometimes challenging conversations internally, um, you know, and allow themselves to be comfortable being uncomfortable uh, because, uh, you know, as, as both Carla and Andy have indicated multiple times, sometimes, many times, uh, it, it does um, bring some uncomfortableness to not only ourselves as leaders, but also our people. Um, the other part of it is, is that, um, and I think Carla talked about it, is we all come to every situation with our own biases. And, and so, you know, making a commitment to, um, you know, train your people and, and educate our people. Uh, we talked a lot about that earlier on, on some of the, the forums that both Andy and Carla talked about, um, you know, around un unconscious bias training, and then sharing best practices, both those that work and those that don't um, because I think that's the way we ultimately make an impact is if we're all in this together and we all um, you know share what each other are doing there's nothing competitive about this situation only that we want to make sure that we're, we're driving each other to, to be better and then lastly um, have a conversation with your board about diversity and what it means for your leadership team and what it means for your board and, and how that impacts your strategy. And that last part is a, is a, is a critical element to uh, this overall conversation, because as we've talked about multiple times here, it all starts at the top. And, and it's really about putting your money where your mouth is and, and doing the right thing from the top all, all the way down. And that includes succession planning, that includes your management team, and that includes the board as well. Hey, Rick, can I just add one thing to what Ray Please. just said, just because I want to I want to put a little exclamation point behind it. You know, we just left a board meeting and we do our annual, you know, succession planning and talent review. And we've shared our DEI commitments with our board. And I've only been with this company for two and a half years, but but it was so wonderful at during the session to hear the board asking my leaders about the diversity of their succession plans and what they were doing to address, you know, their employee engagement survey questions around this. And it, it really does make a difference uh, when you do these things. So I just wanted to add that in. Yep. 
Well, and Rick, the, 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 the great thing about CEO Action right now, too, is um, they've looked outside of the four walls of its you know, 1,300 organizations and, and over the summer announced a program to take on um, and to invest in, in um, um, the development of policies uh, that ultimately impact uh, the way we um, you know, live and play, if you will. What's one thing that the, the the last six months has taught us is that the lines between work and, and home have been blurred completely. Um, and so um, you can't just leave it at home. You, you, you bring it to work. And, and so therefore, there's there was a, an acknowledgement that there's more that this group can do. And so um, there is an effort right now to, to really dig deep into those things that really impact the space. Carla and I talked recently, and one of the things that you said was you can't be one person at work and another person outside of work. That it has, and I think that's exactly what these are. These leaders are talking about. T tell me about that. Tell me about your take on that. Oh, absolutely. Um, again, one of the um, one of the challenges of meeting other people's expectations based on what they're comfortable comfortable with is that you force your team members to have to show up different than who they really are in order to fit into a mold. Whereas if your expectations are reasonable and good and positive, then your team members can show up as they are and do great work in an ecosystem that supports them personally and professionally. So um, again, one of the reasons my company is what it is is because it reflects uh, what I am, which is just a good person of goodwill who's pretty smart and uh, and and wants to be part of a team. And that should be enough in most cases, in most jobs to be successful. And it, it truly is. One of the things that we decided to do years ago was to hire for culture, hire for character and train for skill because a team of great people will be successful. You can always uh, find the right place for, for a great person. And it has cut our stress levels within our company by 99%. <laughs> it just made us a, a better company. So uh, we, we allow our team members to be who they are. Um, I wanted to just uh, make a note on board diversity. There are a lot of conversations being had right now and a lot of hammering about finding exactly the right person for boards, that first black person to diversify a board, our first black female, that's even more daunting. And one of the things I want to uh, just ask people to do is to consider the, re the requirements for their traditional board member for their white males. A lot of the white men who are on boards right now are on boards because they were a golf buddy, a college roommate, or a friend, and that not to belittle their talents, but that's how they were introduced to the board. And the, the bar should not be any higher for a black woman. You don't need a superstar. Um, you're not looking for, I like to say, a Siberian white tiger, right? Talented black women who are capable of serving honorably and efficiently on boards are all over the place. So don't make the bar you know, this is not a moon landing. This is a great board member. Carla, I appreciate your comments. Uh, Andy and Ray, uh, all of you, we are unbelievably in the last few minutes of our conversation. So I'm going to start in the same order, uh, Andy, and talk to you a little bit about two things. One is, as you have been having more of these discussions, have there been those moments when you've gone, the light bulb has gone off? for you or one of your team members. And, and Ray and Carl, I'm gonna ask you all the, more or less the same thing, because uh, if this is about learning, if this is about journey, then at some point there has to be that moment when not everything becomes clear, but at least you understand the process and the problem in a more clear way, Andy. There have been so many moments, Rick, I don't, I don't even know where to start, you know, but I laugh. I. I I've always considered myself to be a pretty, you know, woke kind of person, but I, I'll, I'll share an example. I was having dinner the other night and there happened to be two black people at the table and we were talking about COVID and how it's really exacerbated the haves and have nots in our society. And we were, you know, lamenting what we could do to help. 
And one of the one of the black gentlemen that was there turned to me and he said, "Well, it's about time you all woke up and recognized what's been going on forever. It's your fault." And I think prior to some of the conversations I had had and some of the listening I had been doing, I might have felt defensive. I might have felt like, well, it's not me and I wasn't a part of it. And I sat there and I let it wash over me. And I'm like, you're right. You're, you're, you're absolutely right. And there's so much we can do to solve the problem. So I think, I think the light bulb for me has been uh, sitting in a place of what Ray and Carla has said of learning. Uh, of openness and of um, a lack of defensiveness have been really, really important because we are all going to solve this together. And and I think that's been um, a huge learning for me. And I think for a lot of the folks that work with me. Ray, have you had that moment when you said, wait a minute, I've been doing this wrong? Uh, unfortunately for my team, I've had lots of those moments, I'm sure. Uh, some of which they've shared with me, some of which they probably have walked out of the room. Um, but um, yes, so, um, you know, from from my perspective, I think um, it's really about leaning in and, and listening um, and and frankly, being OK, not saying the perfect thing, um, but lead, lead, leading with your heart um, and the um, the desire to want to further your own learning uh, so that you can push your organization in places that uh, Perhaps um, we've never been, um, and that journey is going to involve some stumbles along the way, and being okay with that, and having a real conversation with your colleagues about the mistakes that you've made, and and the commitment to to, to learn and do better the next time. I think um, so many of us as leaders that are in these positions feel like you have to have the perfect words and the perfect um, you know setting for you know any conversation, and and what I've learned is that that's not the case. People just want you to lean in and and hear them and, and meet them where they are and, and figure out what's right uh, for them. We could go on another hour, but Carla, I've only got about another minute left. Could you uh, talk about the importance of not being petrified by not getting it exactly right? Because I think many people are. I'm an expert on not getting it exactly <laughs> right. So I could talk forever on that, even though I only have a few minutes. But uh, we're leading with our humanity now. We are leading with our vulnerability. And we are, as Ray said, meeting people where they are. We're recreating an ecosystem that can work for everyone. And we're just in a remarkably important place right now. Well, I want to take this opportunity to thank each of you. We are, as I said, almost out of time. But I think there could easily be time to have more of this conversation. And I would be only too proud to be a part of it. I appreciate what each of you has brought and been willing to talk to in a very transparent and frank way and thank the Chamber for bring us all together virtually because this is the first time we've all seen each other as far as I know and uh, I've enjoyed each of you. So let me thank Carl Walker Miller from Walker Miller Energy Services. I want to thank Ray Talang from Michigan PwC and I want to thank uh, Andy Owen from Herman Miller. Uh, what you have talked about here today is the beginning, right? Because there is still going to be much to do as you have each pointed out. I appreciate your efforts. I appreciate your time. Once again, I'd like to thank the Chamber for bringing this all together. The Detroit Regional Chamber's MPC 20 Conversations Respond and Rebuild Digital Series is provided in partnership with Detroit Public Television and presented by Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan with additional support from Accenture, Bank of America, Barton Mallow, Comerica Bank, Consumers Energy, Delta Dental, Dow, DTE Energy, Enbridge Energy, Ford Motor Company, Huntington Bank, ITC, KPMG, the Kresge Foundation, Kroger, Michigan Economic Development Corporation, PNC Bank, Ralph C. Wilson Jr. Foundation, Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans, the Skillman Foundation, and TCF Bank. And by these supporters, Support for Detroit Public TV's coverage is provided by DTE Energy Foundation and Masco.